We're going to ask the gentlemen just to share um, just uh, um, like 30 or 40 seconds on what the theme means to you, fathers and sons, the turning. So we'll start from um, doing um, Taylor. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the theme is very important because it speaks to a central core relationship between a father and a son. And that turning, that turning point is actually a very critical thing because it is the action of the turning that is really why we're here today. And my hope is that out within, within this discussion and out of this discussion, we can have, I would say, a, a better understanding of what the heart of God is about fatherhood and about sonship and for us to embrace that ability to relate to God in that way. Yeah, um, just along that same line for me, the theme of this conference really centers, as he said, around the heart of God. That's what, that's what it really comes down to for me. Um, it, it's a representation of how God loves us, his people, the ones he created. And so he's the one that makes that first move. And so the scripture also says it, that the fathers first turn to the children, the sons. And so for me, that's what it means as a father, I have to be. Yeah, man, just as it says in the scripture, the father first turns to the children. And so for me, that means me as a father, I have to submit myself to the Lord. And so I'm able to actually raise my son the way he's ought to be raised so that he can in turn raise children for himself um, after the heart of the Lord. And so that's what, that's what the theme means for me. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And I am concurring my two brothers. The fact is, as a father, I am expected to set an example for my own son so that I will teach him the things that my father taught me so that he can fulfill his role just like how my father was married for X amount of years and I am close to those years because my father is no longer with us. I would love to see my son. I don't know if I would live that long, but I would love to see my son treating a woman, treating his children based off the same examples and even better that I have said. So I have seen it in the light of God the Father, God the Son, and us as fathers and son turning to God for a better way of living. So when I, when I hear the theme, I think what comes to mind is a passage in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul is giving instructions to different groups of people, wives, husbands, bond servants, but he also gives instructions to fathers and, well, parents and children, so fathers and sons. And I think the, 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 theme stand, the theme comes alive to me in the sense that all of those groups were called to submit to the Lord, um, to submit to each other out of fear or reverential fear of the Lord. And so that looks like how the turning, fathers turning to each other, it, it, it should firstly look like um, what's our relationship firstly with the Lord so that when we're relating to each other, we're able to relate rightly. Um, children in obedience to parents, fathers, and fathers to not exasperate or frustrate the children because that can happen in the Colossians Paul says don't frustrate the children because that can discourage them and so there is a reality in how we treat our children it can discourage them from pursuing the Lord and it can also encourage them to grow up in the Lord so that's what comes to mind Amen Good afternoon again everyone my name is Rajiv Ro and the theme Father, Son, Turning. For me, um, this theme speaks to the fact that father and son, they represent males, males in society, right? And one of the things that we are seeing is that um, as it relates to males, if it is that the male gender gets it right in society, then society will indeed be a better place, right? And what we see in Jamaica, for example, is that a lot of males are out of alignment. So as it relates to father-son turning, starting off with father, 
And if the father gets it right and him teach it to the son, then we can have a society, a future, where um, persons will be turning to the Lord, yielding to, to, to what he has to say, and to be good example in society. So father, son, turning, speak to the male, male getting it right. Amen? So we have some questions. Put your hands together for them, gentlemen, the gentlemen here. All right, so we have a few questions um, that were sent in already. And we are going to see how fast we can go through. So, gentlemen, quick answers, please. Right for these. So, number one question that came in. What was one of the biggest challenge as a teen? And how did you overcome it? So, I know that somebody would have jumped out that question in your heart, in your mind. Who wants to take that one first? What was one of your biggest challenge? I think, Darren, you want to go with that one? What was your biggest challenge as a teen and how did you overcome it? All right, my biggest challenge as a teen was staying pure. And if I would just, just turn this other one, is, is to be honest with myself. So why I said those two things, right? So similar to the testimonies that were shared earlier, um, I had my, had my share about of sexual immorality, right? I, I wasn't pure during my growing up. I had different influences in my life that brought me to that place just as the other gentleman, right? And so going through high school, interestingly enough, I grew up in church, right? So I heard the word and all these things, but at the same time, I'm not sure if you understand this expression, but I'm like a dead tree. It looks good on the outside, but it's rotten on the inside. And nobody really sees, the, sees that it's rotten. And that's what was happening to me spiritually. I was dying spiritually. Coming up in high school, I had the wrong set of friends. And so, um, as I grew up, I started believing in the Word of God. I just wanted to fit in. So yeah, because of all of those different influences and those influences I believed in and I followed those influences, it caused me to live an impure life, uh, a dishonest life, you know, being a hypocrite, basically. How I overcame all this, right? So for me, it was in fifth form, going into sixth form, that I found myself in the school cafeteria realizing that I couldn't live the life that I wanted to live. I wanted to please the Lord. I wanted to actually live right. But I realized I couldn't do it in my own strength. I couldn't. I couldn't. And so I found myself in, that, in, the, in the school lunchroom. Like the Lord really met me in the school lunchroom. Showed me myself that, yo, I am messed up. This double life thing doesn't work out. Is either you're going to choose me or not? And the Lord really met me there. I can't express to you exactly how that worked out in the sense of what that looked like. But I knew that I had to give myself over to the Lord. I said, Lord, you take control of my life. And in me surrendering my life to the Lord in that lunchroom, right, the Lord led me to people that actually stood for the Lord, who actually walked with the Lord. And, I, and that's eventually even how I ended up in Passion and Purity, where I'm a part of a fellowship that our one pursuit is God's heart. And so for you guys, how you overcome this, pursue God's heart. You can't do it in your own strength. You can't do it with, the, with just your works, right? You have to give yourself over to God mm -hmm. and let him give you the strength, the grace to please him. Amen, yeah. amen. Wonderful, wonderful answer. So if it is that we are talking about struggles, right? And that's how you overcame. But what if I don't have the courage to stand out from the crown and you find yourself following the wrong friends. I know you gave a part of the answer. You know, how can a young man overcome following the wrong friends? There's a great influence. Rajiv, you want to take that one? How is it that a young man will stand out in the midst of all this? Especially going to a boys' school. Anybody here go to a boys' school? All boys' school, right. And you want to stand out and you see everything going. Darren said that he had to take with himself a while but somebody is in that situation now what encouragement do you have for them all right so i also went to a boys school and 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 the rev and the rev we got the same school we went to the same school <laughs> Forty scatter said they're known for tests yeah man um uh, the thing about it is that boy i always say it, going to an all boys school it's almost like i don't want to make it so bizarre but it's almost like a prison. It, 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 it is challenging at times because 
you 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 literally you literally um just around boys every day every day and as a as a teen you know really want to seem like a stooge you know i don't know if pe- the young people don't use that, that word anymore maybe they have a different word that different terminology but you know really want to seem like you're soft so in terms of following the crowd you probably want to 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 to, to do that but as a christian right you have to understand your purpose Amen. You have to understand who you are. Because you have Jesus Christ in you, right? You cannot afford to operate just as all the world is. And you can't afford to operate with the world standard. You understand? The Bible says that we are peculiar people. Right? So once we start to understand who we are in Christ, right? I think that will propel us to have the courage right and then we know getting the courage will dis- decipher now to say listen this is wrong because i mean at the end of the day we we, we i mean for me i always tell people when i when i when i'm speaking to younger persons that you will grow older you will grow older you understand you will grow older so when you're 18 you used to do some little things when you're 16 17 you used to do some little things but when you reach a certain age, in your 20s and you reach 30s, you're going to find, say, listen, you're going to make, you're, you're going to find, say, listen, these things are these mistakes you have made when you were younger. Sometimes it affects you. Sometimes it even affects how you are operating, even at that age. So I will always tell persons, say, listen, you're going to get older. And because of that in your mind, you have to create that in your mind to say, listen, I'm going to make proper choices. I am going to do things that are right. I am not going to just be a follower. You understand? And as a Christian, we are also called to be leaders. We are called to be the light. We are called to be the salt. So everything that we do, people must pattern us, not we patterning them. Amen? Amen. Be ye transform. All right? So for me, it is just to understand who we are. So as a youngster, understanding who you are in Christ so you're and patterning the Lord. If you understand who you are in Christ and patterning, you're going to also have friends, mm-hmm. right? Like what Darren is saying, link up with some persons who are Christians as well. And that's how you kind of shape the other the person. Yes, definitely. I really want to put this to Paul though. And um, Paul, we're talking about this whole thing of Christian and whatever it is. Anybody want to really know what a godly man look like? Don't it? Eh? See some person that comes. So Paul, tell us, you know, who is really a godly man and how does somebody become a godly man? Having mm-hmm. gone to another a boy's school as well, you know, Calabar. Right. How? How is it? Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> I pointed out that one for you and a champ's time now. So go ahead, Paul. <laughs> That's all right. I forgive you. <laughs> uh... Yeah, I think I, I can give you a quick answer and then explain. So I think a godly man, so well, a godly man looks like Jesus. And a helpful way is just even the same text I mentioned earlier, Ephesians. It's very interesting that when um, Paul is calling different members of the church, when he's writing the letter, what he tells them is, for husbands, love your wife as Christ. Um, when he's giving as Christ love the church, but I just given the explanation first. He said, love your wife as, and then so he points to somebody else. So before that, when he's speaking about all believers, he says, forgiving each other as God in Christ forgave you. Then jumping down after that, he says, loving each other as Christ um, loved us and gave himself up for us. So constantly, everywhere you see in that letter, you see modeling, pointing to somebody else in order to live a certain way. Um, in the same way, you see in John, he says, for anyone who wants to live, um, please God must walk as Jesus did. So I think being a man is no different. You have to look to Jesus as a model of um, true manhood. Now, what does that look like? I can give you a helpful definition I found that works for me. Um, a true man is one that rejects passivity, leads courageously, and accepts the greater reward, which is God's reward. Rejects passivity, I think in a lot of ways, 
um, a poor man is defined by is your acceptance of responsibility that this is who you are this is what defines you but what you are prone to do especially because of the fall which is prone to be passive in a lot of cases a lot of us i don't care which man is here now we all struggle with the, with, with with passivity before that's something you have to fight against right um when hard times come there's a struggle to be passive and just let somebody else do it but when you have a role or a calling ahead of you it causes you to push beyond that and go towards what you're meant to be so that is reject passivity um leads courageously i think once you aim to be a father you will be a leader i don't think all persons will ever be leaders in a certain capacity but i do think that once you are aiming to be a father you're, you're going to be leading a household so you have to lead courageously and a way of leading courageously is as the same letter ephesians points out jesus gives up his life for all but it's intro interesting that the same instruction that is given to all believers is the same instruction that Paul gives for husbands to love their wives. Love your wife as Christ of the church and gave himself up for the church. So giving up of yourself is putting to death your own self-interest in a lot of ways and putting other per per people's interests ahead of your own. And that, what that will look like is a daily pursuit. So that's leading courageously. And the other part is accepting the greater reward. I don't think the Christian calling is without a reward at the end of the day. And so even as a man living to follow Jesus, you have to know that there is a reward at the end. And that reward fuels your perseverance, pushes you to continue and to be persistent. So I would say having the idea that um, there is the reward put before you to, enter, to energize you or push you to continue and to persevere, that leads you to, to, to seeing what a godly man is, but to actually do it but never forget that the ultimate model that's put before us is jesus um, who has been the perfect man and and i said that lastly because none of us i think will implement that perfectly we fall short in a lot of ways but the perfect example of jesus is the fact that when we look to him we see a standard but we also see the grace extended yeah. that you can when you fail because you may fail you can probably exasperate the children not love your wife completely but that doesn't mean that um uh that doesn't mean that you are not prompted to repent and to continue pushing towards that standard so i think having jesus as a model helps us to not just see a standard that is unattainable but to see somebody who has said that um my grace and mercy is there to lift you up and keep you pushing so. okay thank you paul i think darren wants to just chime in on that was that was that helpful a while ago yeah yeah, yeah, so check Darren, you kind of go ahead, and then the next question will be to Mr. Taylor. Yeah, man, as he was talking about modeling, right? Uh, I had, a, I had a, a thought that came to mind is um, anybody here live in Portmore? Anybody here live in Portmore? All right, so personal experience, I don't like Portmore, right? Because when I go into Portmore, all the houses look alike. Well, for me, for those who live in Portmore, you can't tell the difference, right? But when I go into certain schemes, I don't know where I'm going. I don't, if I don't know the house that I'm going to, everybody house is the same house, right? So why I brought up that example? Why is the question that I thought about is, why is it that all the houses look so alike? Because whoever built those houses was working from the, a very, the same blueprint, right? There was a blueprint and they said that they wanted all the houses to look that way it was stamped right by the contractor general and they said build all the houses this way right now let's go back to the question what does a godly man look like he answered the question right he said that jesus is the example of our godly man and what he did was to create a blueprint he himself is the blueprint he lived it out what a godly man looks like jesus lived it out but then when he finished his mission he gave his disciples the blueprint he said to peter i give you the keys of the kingdom right he gave them the blueprint to become godly men themselves but that if you have the blueprint but don't have the skill to carry it out then the blueprint means nothing right you don't have the power you don't have the tools you don't have the manpower you don't have the funds right now, what is the funds? What is the manpower? What is the skill? 
That's the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus finished yeah. his mission, he gave us the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes. And so when the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us and we surrender to him, not only do we have the blueprint, which is the word of God, but we have the Holy Spirit, which the scripture says that he gives us both the desire yeah. and the power yeah. to actually do it. So when we obey him, we do it. We look like the word. We look like the blueprint. So if you want to know what a godly man looks like, if you want to be a godly man, those are the things that you need. You need the word of God and you need the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Wow, powerful answer. Put your hands together for you. Yeah, man. Yes, that connected. I know we, I think Paul touched on it a little bit, but there's a specific question though that I want um, Mr. Taylor to address. You know, so we know that we'll stand in purity and we can be pure. Amen? Amen. Young men can be pure. Amen? Amen. Young men can live holy. Amen? Amen. But do you, you know, what if somebody messed up? You know, can they maintain or gain purity once more? The, the, the short answer to that is yes. Okay. We are... We are designed in God's image and likeness. And the fact is that as regular people, like me and you, men to man, I can tell you this. We're always going to be challenged in our sexuality. We're always going to be challenged in the place of power. And we're always going to be challenged in the place of money. So these are challenges in three key areas of life. Just as Jesus had to go through the temptation, where the devil tempted him first, he said, boy, turn these stones into bread. Worship me. So we are always faced with challenges. So life is riddled with challenges. And no matter how or what, you are going to face these challenges, and you just have to deal with them. One of the major things is this, is that we know that if we fall, if we come into any problems, it says that God is faithful and just to forgive us if we confess our sins. One of the things that we fail to do most times is this as men, and I can tell you this from even personal experience. We fail to acknowledge the truth about who we really are. We really don't want to look at the man in the mirror and call the spade the spade. Oftentimes we try to shift it or blame it on somebody else. We try to use what we call the scapegoat. Is the devil made me do it? We try to find other means and methods of trying to shift it away rather than coming to the plain truth to know that we have sinned and fallen short. But the fact that you have sinned and fallen short doesn't mean that you are condemned because there is therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Because what? We do not walk after the flesh because we walk after the Spirit of God. And Mr. Column here spoke about a very important principle and I don't want us to miss it. We have a blueprint. We have the blueprint of the Word of God. We have the message of the Word of God which is the gospel of the Word of God which is the transforming power of the Word of God. Many times as men we don't play the power. We don't play the authority of the Word. We don't play the Holy Spirit. We don't don't play everything about what God can do and has done for us. So one of the major things for us to do is to first lift ourselves to the recognition that God wants me to have victory. God wants me to overcome. And the second point you have to come to the place is to accept this. And this we accept out of grace, knowing that God can restore me. Now the fact of the matter is that if you mess up, God says that I have already died. I have sent my son for God so loved the world that what he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe it when you mess up that what you can come back and come back into life God is a restorer God is one who will always a God of the second chance and we say Adam fall God come back and restore it and so therefore God gives us the power to overcome God gives us the wisdom and the grace to overcome and I can say to you as a man if you drop by your 
face, shake off yourself, brush off, and come again. There is no sin, there is no condition that is exempt from the power to deliver you by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to repeat that again. There is nothing that you can do that will prevent the power and the blood of God from delivering you and restoring you. The blood of God is so potent that it doesn't matter what the condition is. Whether it's an illness, whether it's a sickness, whether it's a generational curse, no matter what it is, no matter where it comes from, the blood of God, the word of God is powerful enough to bring restoration and healing to your life. So here's my, my advice to you. Come back to God. So if you sin, I say confess, find somebody that you can relate to, that you can talk to, that can share and help you to actually restore you to come back to the place and even further to where you would have been. So God love you. So the first principle, God love you. God love you and him not turn your back. No matter what, God is still going to love you. But, but I've had sex with a man, God still love you. But I've had sex with six women, God still love you. But I kill a man, God still loves you and he will restore you and his power and his blood will restore you. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Wow, powerful, powerful answer. I'm, I'm throwing this one over to Rev you now. So Rev gave his testimony. You know, Pastor gave his testimony about when we came out of certain situation, right? So I know somebody is sitting down there, you know, because his questions came in from persons of your age. So it says, Why am I seeking love from the opposite sex? And why do I always end up with a broken heart? All right, now you see him smile a while ago. One big question, don't doubt it. Why are you always seeking love from somebody else? Right? And why do you end up, always end up, with a broken heart? Tell us, Pastor. <laughs> All right. Um, I have been there. I have been there. And what I find is, my brothers, even though you have both parents in the house, there is always, because I grew up with eight, seven brothers and two sisters. So it was a big house. But there was always something. And it's like you were always searching. And I got the answer later on. I was looking for things in the wrong places. I was looking for love from the opposite sex. And guess what happened? I kept getting, I had two serious breakup after all my, my gimmicks and everything. And I reached the point where I considered suicide. I never tell you everything. But I get to that point where I remember I was living in Gathermead and there was a canal and I went out and I looked because they say in that canal they have alligators and I thought of choking off when I lie to you after the breakups I thought because my brothers I kept looking for love in the wrong places and if you look for it in the wrong places you're gonna get burned that's all we say it back, back then. You will get burned. And I kept looking for it in the wrong places. So if you look for love in the wrong places, be prepared to be heartbroken. It's not a myth. I have had it. I have been there, done that. Whoa. So Pastor, no, no, we're getting a little bit somewhere now. So Pastor is saying we, we look, we love it at the wrong place. So what if now we in that place you now? And I want um, Rajiv to take this one here. Rajiv, over to you. So Rajiv, I am saying that in a situation where my heart is broken, I may cry out to God. I may ball. I may say, God, not today. So where is God in this situation when I need him the most? We take care of the heart taker right now, you know. Me mash up the girl, God left me. Whosoever left me, me like the girl. And me go one day and sit her down, Bridget, sit her down nice, you know. 
And I said, put me out to her. And she just said, you are my friend. Hey, hey, Rajiv, <laughs> she, she, she she's a ball to God. We got there. She sent it at the friend zone. She sent it at the friend zone. After you carry a bag, you do everything for her. Yeah. Baby, you just put one day to sit down with her and say, me want to pour up, me don't tell you how much. Yeah. Love you. Yeah. And she does. Friend zone, yeah, you talk quiet to God. We got there. Yeah, it's a, the man, it's a terrible, it's a terrible spot to be in, you know, <laughs> to, to be in a friend zone. You know, you, you, you're actually attracted to a, a young miss. But then, but sometimes it's when you're shy and, and you never give out the, the intention first. Sometimes that happens to you, you know. Sometimes you have to make it clear, say, boy, yeah, me attracted to you, you know, and me want to forget to know you more. You understand? But when you wait till it's too late, she does should be in that friend zone corner there. And it does hurt your heart. But the thing about this is that, you see, once you're looking for love, or you're, you're making um, it all about finding love in a person, right? A next human being, you're bound to fail. You're born to fail. That's just it. You're born to fail. Christ alone can give you that guarantee, that love, that unconditional love. You understand? No human being can give you that love. I mean, we're all going to fall short. One way, shape, or form, we're going to fall short of giving that ultimate love. You understand? So, once you decide in your mind, say, boy, I may, may I look into my girlfriend for give me that love that you go fall short. Right? But the thing about it is that the Lord, he says that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Once you cry out to the Lord in that moment where you are feeling alone, where you are feeling sad, where you are feeling depressed, where you are feeling like, boy, I eat this. Him, he will come alongside you. He's a comforter. Yeah. Right? He is a comforter. So God is always there. He is omnipresent. Mm -hmm. Right? He is always there. You know? But the thing about it is that while he's om omnipresent, there's a thing called his manifest presence. Yeah. Right? And it's when you interact with him, mm -hmm. when you engage him, when you call oh, upon him, oh, yeah. then he manifests himself. Right? So when you call upon God, then he manifests. He come alongside you and he comfort you. So he's always there. Always, always there. You understand? And I mean, when you're young at that age, you have to understand, say, well, I think as a, as a, as a person, we used to go to boys' school. We kind of, <laughs> yeah, we kind of, we kind of, we kind of understand, say, you got to have some of them break heart moment, you know? And you know, some of us know, say, just, just, just tough it out. You understand? <laughs> just, just, yeah, just yeah. cry upon the Lord. Just, just tough it out. Yeah. You understand? It not going to kill you. Or it shouldn't kill you. I say it go. Yeah, and, 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 and the thing about it you now is that the spirit of rejection is real, you know? Yes. Yeah. You understand? Yes. So, I mean, we, we, we have to pray about that as well. That spirit of rejection. Because sometimes when we are rejected, we go on now one corner and we just yeah. isolate ourselves. But, when you're feeling alone, just call upon the name of Jesus. That is my, my thing for that. And, and I think I want to add to that now. Put your hands together. The, the answer is real, don't it? Yeah. You know, I, I want to just add something to it. That when you even feel rejected. Because it happened to me too, you know. Yes. May I tell you? And what, one of the things that you do is to keep some things open. Yes. Yes, when you keep your things secret, Bridget. Are you along our night, you know? Yes. Yeah. So you talk to somebody. Yeah. yeah, you don't have no moment where you say lock up in a room where you are deep. Come to a friend of mine, come out of that room there, you know. Let, let me share, yeah. let me yeah. share yeah. a little, yeah. let me share yeah. a little one. So, I remember as a, as a youngster, um, it was a lady, it was, it was a girl that introduced me to Christ. She always used to say to me, say, come to church with me now, Rajiv, come to church with me now. A girl, you follow God church. <laughs> All right, it's hard now. Yeah. She always said, say, come to church with me now. And I always say to her, say, listen, boy, I don't have the time, you know, because you see on a Saturday, we usually go on party or something. And by Sunday, me tired. Me can't manage the church thing. And I remember because she had pressed me so much, I mean, didn't really check for her, you know. And I say, you know what? I go go to church. And I remember when I went to church that Sunday, 
and I sat beside her, and there was a next, a, 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 a old lady on the other side of us. And she was saying to me that, young man, you're a Christian. And I said, no, you know. She said, no, saying if you try Jesus, he's sweeter than rice and peas and so on and so forth. And I remember just chuckling to myself. And long and short of it was that I got saved and I got baptized. And can I tell you, say, I got baptized like the December. By the January, the same girl who carried me to church, she broke up with me. Oh my God. Me me devastated. The devil oh tell me, say, come out of church. What is this? Yes. This now go work out. <laughs> I, I was so, I was so mad and angry oh. at the whole thing. And I remember the Lord speaking to me. And the Lord said to me that, get involved. Oh God, yes. Get involved. Get involved. And yes. I remember I said, you know what? I can do a little acting. And I said, I'm going to join the drama group, the youth drama group. Mm -hmm. And I did a puzzle myself and I said, when they meet, and I remember the next young lady saw me the Saturday early in the morning and said to me, say, you look like somebody who can't act. Why you not join drama? And I was like, really? I'm not even tell this girl say I want to join the drama or nothing, but she just introduced me to drama and tell me, yeah. say, 4 o'clock in the evening, drama practice. Yeah. And I tell you, you see, when I got involved in drama, oh. and I just, I just, I just start focus on God, focus on the things of God, and decide, say, listen, I'm going to grow. Can I tell you, say, the girl, warm me back it up. Aye. But I tell her, I say, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten over. So, just get involved. Get involved. Amen. Get involved. Amen. That yes. is so powerful. Yes. Um, I know you would have shared a testimony in other places. And there's somebody here, I say, yeah, me here on a talk. I want to talk like when I go up in a Christian home and everything and so. Paul, briefly, share with me. I know you, you shared a testimony about the home that you grew up in. And there was some kind of Rastafarian influence, right, Paul? Right. And and how is it that God would have helped you in that situation? And speak to a young man right now, maybe grew up in that kind of home, as as, as Bishop Ero Bear Jr. spoke this morning about the Rastafarian influence in Jamaica. How can a young man live under that condition and still come out to stand pure for the Lord? Paul, you cannot share that. Uh, yeah, uh, let me see. I think, I think a young man um, in a situation like that. So I, I'll put it. I'll put it two ways. This is a challenge, I think, for the church that's here. But then it's an encouragement for whoever may be in such a situation. So yeah. So I answer it in two ways. So there's a challenge, I think, to the church, who's here. But then it's also an uh, encouragement to the young person or uh, whomever that may be living in such a situation. I think in, in, in there, there is a sense in which you, you are in a space where you will have to trust God. But I think what may be very important is to have a proper understanding of what it means to be a Christian. And this is what I mean. In a lot of ways, when I was in high school, buzzing around was the idea of um, every hardship was something to be delivered from. Every um, affliction or rough space was never got used in it per se and the idea was um, what will, what will, if, 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 if certain things reach it must be something you do wrong because there was an expectation of what your Christian life should look like now let me just put it this way I don't think the scriptures give that kind of view it arms you with the view that you're going to face suffering you will face hardship. And I think growing up in a space where you may be a Christian, but you're in a home space where it's probably Rasta, you will probably have to go face ridicule and have a love in light of that. And you can't say that's impossible. I mean, we're, as a staff, we're going through the book of Second Thessalonians, a letter to, that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. And what is interesting for us is in chapter one, the first, ver first few verses, Paul commends the church and what he says is that we find that in the face of affliction and persecution your love for the saints are growing and when we saw that we were like wow look on that most people when you eat suffering it make you start thinking more about yourself you want to quit yourself and say well me I forgot to start over myself now but for these people what grew was love and what grew was 
a service to other people. So the truth is, much of the, the fruits that we say we're praying for, they're going to be come and they're going to bear fruit in the face of trials, tribulations, persecution. So you will know what it has to look like to um to submit um to somebody who don't think the best of you, but you're going to have to win them over by your good conduct, right? You're going to know what it looks like to not revile when you are being reviled. All those things you're going to have to look on. And the truth is, there is the assurance that possibly the Lord may save people like that. So you will grow in prayer in a space that you're going to have to depend on the Lord for the strength for it. You will grow just in terms of your tolerance, forbearance, and patience. Those are all fruits of the Spirit that may not have come otherwise.